Understanding Intermediate Accounting Part 28 Leases, Capital versus Operating Leases, and Using FASB Codes. This is Ken Boyd, the owner of St. Louis Test Preparation. Here's our email address and our phone number. You'll find us on Facebook at St. Louis Test Prep. I wanted to go to a case study that I did with a recent student of mine. And the subject of the case study was a case on leases of land and buildings. And I want to walk you through, first of all, a scenario. I've tried to put some of this information in different colors because it's a long document. I don't want to make sure people can uh, see it and that it's a little eye-catching. So uh, Marple's model development, which we're going to call M&M, &M, enters into a lease for two different assets. It says specifically they enter into a 99-year lease with Don the Duck Trumper as the lessor. So M&M &M is the lessee, the renter, if you will. Trumper is lessor. What are we leasing? Well, we're leasing a building. The lessee is going to modify the building and also make other significant leasehold improvements. Maybe they're going to uh, do a build-out inside the building to make it fit their needs walls, etc. Maybe they're going to do some expensive uh, landscaping outside, build driveways, whatever it might be. So think about those issues. How much is uh, m and going to pay in lease payment? For the first 40 years, the building rental will be $8.5 million a year. The land rent payments will be, lease payments will be $1.5 million a year. Assume end of the year rentals, which doesn't tie into this example. After 40 years, which is in brown, which is the expected end of the remaining useful life of the building, there's a clue, there will be no further building rent payments. Now that makes sense because if the useful life of the building is over, why would we be making lease payments on something that has no more useful life? So that makes sense. But bear in mind that the lease payments make up the entire useful life of the building. That's a clue as to whether or not we're going to capitalize the lease. So after 40 years, which is the expected ending, remaining useful life of the building, no more building payments. The only rental or lease payments for the next 59 years will be the land portion of the lease. Remember that land, by definition, has no defined useful life. Okay. But Duck, the lessor, is going to insist in increases in the base rent every 10 years. And he would like those increases in rent tied to the Consumer Price Index, CPI, which measures inflation, the overall increase in retail prices. You may have hear about CPI in the news media when we're measuring inflation. But it can't go up. It can't go really high or really low. It's going to be within a range. So it says the rental can't be less than a 20% increase or greater than a 60% increase, which protects the lessee from a huge increase within any one 10-year period. Okay. Uh, I'm going to skip through the first part of this next paragraph and get to sort of the meat of it. It says when the lease was structured, M&M &M has the right, the lessee has the right to terminate the agreement at the end of each 10-year period. So if we get to year, the end of year 10 and M&M, &M, 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 the lessee says, um, I want to relocate, they, can, they have a right to terminate the lease. However, <clears throat> if they do, if they elect to exercise the right to terminate, M&M &M would require to transfer the building and any other related Leasehold improvements back to Duck, who's the lessor, without compensation. So M&M, &M, the lessee, if they terminate, loses all that work they did on the building and the land. They lose that if they decide to terminate. We go on to say that M&M &M expanded significant funds to remodel the building and make improvements on the land. And it says, for book purposes, accounting purposes, the building and the related land improvements were depreciated to zero over their depreciable life. 
Now, um, there were some things in this problem that weren't clear based on the language in the question. I'm assuming here that we're depreciating the improvements because by definition land does not depreciate, amortize, it doesn't go down in value by definition. So I'm talking about the uh, furniture and fixtures that m and the lessee put in the building. I'm talking about uh, landscaping, things that could theoretically be removed, maybe a retaining wall. Okay. What's M&M's plan? Well, they intend to rent the building for 40 years, and at the end of 40 years, M&M, the lessee, plans to construct a new building and hopefully occupy it going forward. So they really have 40 years in mind as the time frame for the lease. That's the explanation of the case, and then we go on to three or four bullet points. And I did... Some, uh, the student was asked to do some looking in the FASB code, and I've uh, written some notes about what was in the FASB code without taking the time to go into it. It says at the end of the lease, after that 99 years, the land will revert to lessor, duck who's the lessor. So the lessee m and does not get the asset once the lease is over. So the first question, and m and is questioning whether or not this lease is a capital lease or whether it's an operating lease or maybe the buildings one type and the land is the other and I put a FASB code reference here and the, if you go to that code reference it's very similar to the way the definition of capital leases is laid out here this is not directly from the FASB but it's close to what they say there and I thought this first paragraph was particularly helpful if a lease fulfills certain conditions that indicate a transfer of, quote, material ownership interest, what does that mean? Material ownership interest is defined as a transfer of most of the risk and reward of ownership, which means for all intents and purposes, you own it. And if you own it, we would consider that a capital lease in the books of the lessee. This particular definition goes on to say, fulfillment of any one of the following conditions would indicate that material ownership interest, which we talked about up here, which would cause it to be considered a capital lease. Number one, the lease transfers title to the lessee at the end of the lease term. We know that's false for both the building and the land. We just found out about the land at the top. Lessee has the option to buy the asset at a bargain price, sometimes called bargain purchase option or BPO. We know that's false. That was not mentioned in the question. Three and four, we have to go on to some assumptions because I think the case is incomplete or unclear. It says the present value of an annual annuity of rentals is greater than or equal to 90% of the fair market value of the asset at least inception. Well, unfortunately, FMV, fair market value, is not known. It was not mentioned in the question. We have dollar amounts of rent payments. But we don't know anything about fair market value. So I had to make an assumption that the answer to that one was no. I don't have enough information. Number four, the lease term is equal to 75% or more of the asset's life. Now, this brings up another variable. The land has no known useful life. We found out that the building has a lease term of 40 years, which is equal to the useful life here in red. So it sounds like, so far, we're not sure about the land. The building, so far, sounds like a capital lease, since the term of the building lease is equal to its useful life. We've got a wrinkle that comes up in the second bullet point. And before we get there, I wanted to mention another website source that says, had this phrase written here in brown. Land is normally classified as an operating lease unless title passes to the lessee at the end of the lease term. And in this case, that's false. The title doesn't pass. So based on this source, it sounds like the land's probably an operating lease. So we're going to go on that assumption. We think the land's an operating lease based on this other site that gave us a little more information. And we think the building 
meets criteria number four, and if it meets that criteria, it's a capital leash. But we've got an exception. Because what we find out in the next bullet point is, is a reminder that there's a cancellation provision, that after 10 years, M&M, &M, the lessee, can walk away from the lease as long as they give the land, the building, and the improvements back. So since there's a cancellation provision, that's an exception to the capitalization criteria. So as a result, both the building and the land are operating leases based on what we found out so far. The second bullet point the question was asked, due to the cancellation provision of the lease agreement, M&M &M is having difficulty determining the lease term. Well, how long is the lease? So we went to this FASB code, which says in part, for a lessee, that would be M&M &M in this case, Minimum lease payments comprise the payments that the lessee M&M &M, is obligated to make or can be required to make in connection with the lease property, excluding both of the following. And one of the exclusions was if there was a contingent rental. Cancellation provisions make rental payments after year 10, in this case, contingent. It's contingent on whether M&M &M wants to cancel or not. So based on that assumption that we said, we're going to include years 1 to 10 as the term of the lease because after year 10, M&M &M can choose not to renew, which is something that's contingent. And if it's contingent, we shouldn't include that in our lease term. So we said the lease term is that first set of years 1 to 10 only. The third bullet point says, well, we've got these rent increases based on CPI. And M&M, &M, the lessee, is unsure how rental payments should be recognized over the lease term. The question says, for example, if some or all a part of this lease is a capital lease, what are the minimum lease payments used in assessing how much we're going to capitalize? Well, so far, we don't think either one is a capital lease. Should he or she project increases in rentals in determining minimum lease payments? Should we split it somehow between the land and the building? Not sure. Um, another source that we looked up said, under an operating lease, you're typically going to recognize on a straight line basis the lease, the payments over the lease term, and you might ignore the present value calculation. Okay. That part I'm really going to get rid of, which isn't as germane. And let's talk about this FASB code, which says in part, <coughs> lease payments that depend on an existing index or rate, like consumer price index, mentioned right here, shall be included in the minimum lease payments based on the index or rate existing at the lease inception which implies using CPI, Consumer Price Index, when the lease is agreed to. However, the cancellation provision that we talked about above means that the lease term is only for the first 10 years. As a result, we don't use CPI because CPI doesn't kick on until the second 10-year period. So in so many words, we're going to treat this as a new lease every 10 years. Because the whole deal gets redone, assuming M&M &M, the lessee is going to lease it again. The final note, well, what about this remodeling and land improvement? How do we handle that? Are they part of some minimum lease payment if this is a capital lease? Well, we know it's not. It's an operating lease. And how should they be treated? So the final FASB that I found I have down here at the bottom. It says leasehold improvements in an operating lease, which is true here, that are in place and service significantly after and not contemplated at or near the beginning of the lease term. Well, we were kind of contemplating putting in those land improvements right when we started. Shall be amortized over the shorter of the following terms, and there's two of them, A and B. A, useful life of the assets. 
or B, a term that includes required lease periods and renewals that are deemed to be reasonably assured. Well, this gets a little complicated. And we have to do some interpreting. Useful life of the assets. Well, if by assets we mean, in quotes here, the remodeling and the land improvements, which would be the furniture and fixtures and the building that we put in when we remodel, and the retaining wall that we put in as land improvement, those are the, quote, assets, unquote. Not the land in the building itself. We know the building has a 40-year useful life, and the land essentially has an unlimited useful life. So that's what's going on with B, useful life, or with A, excuse me. B says, a term that includes retired lease payments and renewals that are deemed to be reasonably assured. And the question that we were asking ourselves was, can we assume that the renewal at the end of year 10 is reasonably assured? Well, I don't think we can. So we say there's no assurance that the lease will be renewed beyond 10 years, therefore B doesn't apply. So if B doesn't apply, we're going to use A, the useful life of the assets, and use that period to amortize the remodeling and the land improvements. We're going to use useful life because these renewals are not reasonably assured. Kind of a complicated question, not completely clear because I think the case study didn't address some of the features that were in the FASBs that we looked up. That's as far as we're going to get on Intermediate Accounting Part 28. Continuous Classroom is our monthly small group live chats on critical accounting topics that you'll find on our site, on our website. The YouTube channel is Ken Boyd STL, all one word. There's a complete list of the videos on our website. For live one-on-one -on -one tutoring and live chat sessions, our website is stltest.net. Here's our email and our phone number. Thanks very much, and we'll see you next time.